I heard it's about a little boy and little girl in church. Y'all heard this one? The little boy was talking. The little girl leaned over. And, Shh. Talk, talk. He looked at her and said, Why should I not talk? She said, Because people are sleeping. <laughs> You can use that one to wake up your congregation with. <laughs> I don't remember very many jokes. And I've, I've had more jokes in the last two days come to mind than I can remember. So I guess you guys needed to hear a joke or two while we were here. This year, the next couple of days. But, um, these principles are in here for, for several reasons. Uh, the, the last one, interpret volitionally, recognize human volition, uh, it, interestingly enough, is not found in some of the hermeneutics books. And it struck me while I was going through there, why did they leave that out? Uh, and there are a lot of different factors as to why they may have chosen to leave that out, but... I see the issue of volition as central to the conflict between God and Satan. Right in the middle of it. When God gave his creatures, some of them, the perfect ability to choose, he made them accountable for their decision. By doing that, they became the primary cause of their decision. His primary cause was to give his creatures the ability to choose. But making us in his image gave us also the ability to choose with the accountability for that decision. You become the primary cause of your decision. Once you make it. That's why God rewards it. That's why He disciplines it. That's why He corrects it. Each of us do the primary cause. That means when I choose to love Him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that is a decision that I am the primary cause of. I can be influenced. I can be influenced by the world to make decisions, by the flesh from inside to make decisions, by the devil, uh, although he's not going to mess with me, I don't believe. I'm not high enough on the, the list. But we can be influenced to make decisions. But do you remember a man named Legion? Demon possessed had lost control of his body to demon possession. And yet, he was able to make a decision for the Lord. Talk about influence and the power of the will that God gave to us. So while we have this ability to decide, God does not make the decisions for us. He influences them. Satan influences them. But you have to decide. Now, that, in a sense, to me, is very scary. And in a sense, is very comforting. And I believe that's kind of an inner turmoil that we have. I have freedom to choose. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Keep standing firm. That's a volitional decision on your part. Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Decision on your part. Do not turn your your um, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. You can choose, even as a believer, 
to use your decision making process as an opportunity for the flesh the lust of the eyes the boastful pride of life all of those things that Mark 7 proceed from the inside of man and defile the man out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders adulteries, you, you know the list right? that decision though is to whether or not to pursue the things of the world or through love serve one another that's 5.13 in Galatians 5.16 the Spirit you have the Spirit inside of you right the Holy Spirit's on the inside sets his desire against the flesh and the flesh his desire its desire against the Spirit and these are literally at war with one another that's the word they're at war so in the inside of us we have a conflict of choosing for God or choosing against God that goes on for the entirety of our life and we have to be trained through the word through self discipline trained to discern good and evil and trained in righteousness what is righteousness? Is that getting that straight? But again, it comes down to a decision. God gave us the ability to decide. Whenever He gave us that ability, we become the primary cause of that decision, even though influenced by other things. Now, we're going to look at covenants. There's some things that are very um, near and dear to my thinking because they clarify so many things. And covenants is a very uh, wonderful part of the Word of God, just like the rest of the part. There I go again. Along with a later point called dispensations. Dispensations. Certain time frames in history in which God does things a certain way. Okay? Now, we're going to principle 8 remember the covenants a covenant is a contract okay? it is an agreement sometimes it is a contract that only goes one way and then it becomes unconditional other times it is a contract that has conditions attached to it <coughs> There are nine contracts that are mentioned in Scripture. Some are conditional. Most are conditional. A couple are unconditional. And it's important to know what, what those are and what the conditions are. The Edenic, Edenic Covenant, this was in the Garden of Eden. And... Um, made between Adam and God. God placed Adam in the garden. You know the story. I don't need to, to go through all of it. The covenant was accepted by man, but broken by man. See that tree, Adam? He said, I want you to look at all the other trees. I want you to eat from all the other trees. Literally, the Hebrew says, I want you to eat from every tree of the garden. Okay? Not, not just eat from the trees I want you to eat from every tree in the garden except one, we know that one tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil do not eat from it because in the day you eat from it you will die Hebrew literally says dying you shall die the word die is there twice and most translations put Indeed, you will indeed die. You will surely die. It will do something. I like the literal that says dying. You shall die. Because when I was a kid reading the Bible, and I read that, Adam, don't eat. Oh, next chapter, Adam ate. Adam didn't die. That bothered me. I was happy for Adam that he didn't die. 
But why didn't he die? But he did. The first nine. Spiritual. He was created spiritually alive in fellowship with God. The wages of sin is death. He sinned. The first death was spiritual. You shall die happened 930 years later. Or 50, 950, one of those two numbers. Dying, he died immediately. You shall die, that's the future. He died in the future. That was a great illumination for me when God showed me that there were two words there and I could understand what it, what it meant. Now the identic covenant is no longer in effect. Because when Adam broke it, he was thrown out of the garden. He was no longer permitted to stay there to keep it and tend it and guard it. It's interesting that Adam was told to guard it. Against who? Talking snakes, I guess. <laughs> he didn't do a very good job at that, did he? But he was put in there to guard it. And he failed. So that covenant is passed. But now there is the Adamic covenant. And this is a covenant with Adam. It was made between God and Adam in the garden after the fall before he was expelled and it was unconditional. And this basically, a covenant is, is a promise in a sense. And uh, it dealt with the consequences of original sin which is known as the fall. Okay? God cursed there the instrument of deception we know in 3.14. He brought the conflict into human history between the seed of the woman the seed of the serpent. I will put hostility between your seed and his seed. Okay? There's going to be a war going on according to this covenant. Not all covenants see or about uh, milk and honey in the land of promise. Sorry. Some of them are contracts and things that say this is the way it's going to be and there's going to be discipline. The woman was given pain and childbearing. Uh, the earth was cursed, causing difficulty in the production of food. It will bring forth thorns and thistles. Now, the man and the woman were scheduled to die physically and they were both expelled from perfect environment. That teaches me a lot. A lot of people think that if we get the environment right, then everybody will make all the good decisions and love one another and love God. And guess what? <laughs> perfect environment. People with no sin nature still fail. Sometimes we think that if we parent our children perfectly, they will turn out perfectly. And some people think they have failed if their children, who have the ability to decide, start deciding the wrong way. The perfect parent of Adam and Eve his two kids sinned. That should tell us that our kids are going to sin because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it should tell us that although there was discipline, there was grace. There was grace. But no, we as parents, we need the righteousness, but we need the grace. The Lord came full of grace and truth, right? Truth without grace is too harsh. Grace without truth is too easy. We need the balance, and we pray for the wisdom to do it. The Adamic covenant spans all dispensations and will be in effect for all humanity, humanity until God puts the devil in the lake of fire. Okay, so the Adamic covenant is still there. We are all born in Adam. We all receive his sin and we all stand condemned 
even if we do not sin in the likeness of Adam's offense. Romans 5. Now, that's the Adamic covenant. The next covenant is the Noahic covenant. And that's in Genesis 8. We know about the rainbow that we see in the sky when the sun comes out after the rain's been, been uh, falling. Beautiful to see. I, I've lived long enough to see some really beautiful rainbows. I'm sure you have too. I actually saw one from an airplane one time out the window. And it was absolutely magnificent. It was a double rainbow. It had the rainbow and then had a reflection back behind it. And it was it was amazing. And you just look at it with your mouth open, thinking, boy, this is really amazing to see God's incredible grace. And you know what? It's a promise. And the bow is used in Scripture for strength. The rainbow is the sign of God's omnipotence guaranteeing there will never be a universal flood again on the planet. So every time I see a rainbow in the sky, I'm reminded of the omnipotence of God that has kept His promise since 2300 B.C. Wow. Over 4,000 years that he stepped in. Now, this is an unconditional covenant. It's given to the entire earth. It's for all mankind. So while there are local floods, there's not ever going to be any more universal floods because God has said it. Then there's the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this is the promise we mentioned earlier of real estate. That piece of land was given to the Jewish nation. The inheritance forever will only be the believing Jews. It is a piece of land that goes from what is called the River of Egypt to the Euphrates River. That's where modern day Iraq is located. It encompasses all the lands of Palestine. It encompasses most of Saudi Arabia. The Jews have never possessed that land yet. And yet God said, I'm going to give it to you. That is a promise. That is a prophecy that recognizes the volition of all the human beings that would be around and in existence for thousands of years that one day he's going to fulfill. Interpreting literally means that I believe he is going to literally fulfill his promise to Israel. Okay? Literally means that I believe that piece of land is given to the nation of Israel literally means that I believe that Jesus Christ will take his seat on the throne in the temple and rule it for a thousand years. And that David will sit there next to him. That's what the scripture says. Now, the Abrahamic covenant had innumerable descendants. Now, in one place it says it's the dust of the earth. of Abraham's descendants. There's a lot of dust on the earth, right? That's an analogy, that's figurative language of a whole lot of genetic descendants of Abraham. Remember when God gave him the promise he was 75 years old and didn't have a child. Uh, he actually had one when he was 86 named Ishmael but the child of promise not until he was a hundred years old then it says that your descendants shall be as the stars of the heavens normally stars are used to talk about spiritual descendants so Abraham you're going to have a lot of people 
from your loins genetically. But you're going to have a lot of people too that are going to be spiritual descendants as well. So here is this promise given to racial Israel. I will make you, he said, a great nation. The church is not a nation. We make differences where God makes differences. The church is a bride. So the promise to Abraham is to have a great nation. A piece of real estate, racial descendants, spiritual descendants, and a national entity. That's the promise to Abraham. And the third part is the line of the Messiah that has already been fulfilled. In you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I will give to your seed, Abraham, this land. The promise was made to the seed and not to seeds. The promise was made to Jesus Christ. The Abrahamic covenant, parts of it yet to be fulfilled. Then the Mosaic covenant, 430 years later. Galatians 3, 17. Promise to Abraham, 430 years later, Law of Moses. And this is a conditional covenant. It talks about, if you do this, then I will do this. The Lord said, I set in front of you blessings, I set in front of you curses. He said, if you harm your neighbor, this is what you have to do. He said, I don't want you to eat certain foods. I want you to take care of certain hygiene issues. I, 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 I'm setting up a place for you to bury your dead. Okay, when that occurs, he set those things up. But he said, the blessings part is directly related to obedience. So it's conditional covenant. Okay? Never designed to save. You're only saved by belief in Yahweh, the Lord, the coming Messiah. The reality behind the sacrifices that we talked about in Leviticus. I believe that the gospel taught by Moses was as clear as the gospel taught by Paul. But over the course of 1,500 years, the priesthood became corrupted scriptures became corrupted the Jews consistently said no to their Lord how long did it take for the Jews to turn their back on the one who had just parted the Red Sea weeks days what did they do they built a golden calf huh. and the Lord took about two and a half million Jews that walked out of Egypt. Only two of the founding fathers went into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. The rest died in the desert for their disobedience. Okay? Were some saved? We know that many were saved because they cried out to the Lord, Exodus 1, and he heard them. When they cry out to the Lord, He usually listens. And He helps. And He delivers. And He restores. But then, they go into the land and things go well with them and they forget where they came. Then the Davidic covenant. This is a covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. It's unconditional to David. And it established the uh, covenants of the, the greater son that was fulfilled in the coming Messiah. There was a, uh, a psalm that the Jews had a lot of trouble with. And it's Psalm 110, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. For your feet. 
Now, the Lord said to my Lord, who, who's talking to who? What is going on? Jesus posed this problem to the Pharisees because they've been trying to solve it. It was a big topic of discussion we find from their writings. Uh, it was a big topic of discussion when Jesus walked the earth. Jesus, led by the Spirit, knew that. He said, I want to ask you a question. Messiah, how can Messiah be called Yahweh and be David's son? The answer didn't seem to logically make sense. How could he be Yahweh and the son of David? The answer, he was both God and man at the same time. The technical term is the hypostatic union. God and man together. It's not something that it's not a doctrine that just came up at the first advent or in the life of Paul. People didn't find a good teacher named Jesus and suddenly infer on him deity or divinity. Many of the world religious leaders did not claim God when they lived. But their people centuries later decided they were gods. Jesus came and said, I'm him. Before Abraham came into existence, I am. What an amazing statement. The Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, it's a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant. It promises a dispersion to the Jewish people in Deuteronomy 30. It says they're going to go out and that they're going to come back and they're going to have that piece of land, that land of Palestine. It is uh, for the age of Israel. It'll be fulfilled when the Jews are supernaturally regathered at the second advent and the land promised to Abraham from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates is established. So, from the giving of the covenant forward, the interpreter should consider that dispersions from the land are only temporary. The Jews were dispersed. The northern kingdom was decimated and sent out. Ten of the tribes were gone in 721 B.C. by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom was dispersed in 586 B.C. into the land of Babylon. And they're away from their land. If you were a Jew alive then, what would you be able to say? One day, God will bring us back. This land he gave to Abraham, and one day he would bring us back. I believe the Jewish people, God chose, in a sense, to show the extent of his grace. Fifteen hundred years of Jewish history before 70 A.D. and that dispersion, they did not do many things right for very long. Look at the judges. The period of Joshua after the conquest, the historian Josephus tells us, was 20 years. Not inspired of God, but probably fairly accurate. The period of the judges, they did good, they did bad. They did good, they did bad. They did good, they did bad. And they kept getting worse. Then they got salt. And then they got a lot worse. And then David, from 1010 to 970 BC, and they went back up here. And then Solomon, 
they dropped a bit. But after Solomon, the kingdom split into two kingdoms, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Isaiah was telling the northern kingdom, you better straighten that. You better get it right. You better change your way. You better repent. God is going to destroy you, even if you're his chosen people. And they didn't listen, and God did. Then the prophets to the southern kingdom. And they thought because they were Jews and because they were chosen and because they offered the sacrifices that no other part of their life was right, that God would not harm them. And Jeremiah and the other prophets are trying to say, yes, he will. You're not having a change of mind. There's no repentance there, but for many people, there will be a lot of waste. Sin to a believer is a waste of time. Because we've already been given his, we've been given our passport into heaven. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ is what gets us into heaven. We've already been given that. But if we don't produce fruit, no production, there, we don't use what God has given to us, we're saved so as by fire. Just bear that we're saved. The new covenant to the church. Okay, and that is rule. So we are wading through this. I know it's kind of slow. Uh, so before anybody gets to snoring from carrying on, let's uh, take five, ten. Take is there is love. is love. He has risen from the dead. Itself, but it really does not. If we start with the belief that uh, God is not the author of confusion, then what we are going to find is that he has put things in order. But he has given us a test to see whether or not we will seek him and seek to find how he has designed this amazing plan. So, <clears throat> We, are, uh, we have six principles that connect to the use of this particular rule. And 
The first principle that we're going to look at is to look for the differences. It's pretty good. We might try to do that a couple more times before we get out of here. You guys like that? We'll see what we can do. Okay. We're and uh, we're at uh, page 157 now. We're in principle three: compare scripture with scripture. We're going to uh, connect. Uh, I need to speak slower. <laughs> we are going to. Oh, Dave. <laughs> we are uh, going to connect six more principles under this one called uh, seek to be wise by comparing scripture with scripture and Solomon in Proverbs 1 I just mentioned this he speaks about he writes Proverbs to teach us how to understand the sayings of a wise man, how to understand the riddle. Uh, to me, that says that there are puzzles in Scripture, like a jigsaw puzzle. They have different pieces. And these different pieces all fit together very clearly and very specifically once you find which piece fits the other piece. Uh, I was teaching this last week in coaching about prophecy because prophecy is a massive jigsaw puzzle. About 10,000 verses in the scripture are prophetic verses. Some are fulfilled. Some are not fulfilled. They each contain many, many words. So you have 10,000 verses with what? How many were? 100,000? 200,000? words to go through and analyze and they all fit and when I was teaching this last week I saw a uh, comic strip in the newspaper and it was Henry and Henry's mom gave him a jigsaw puzzle to put together 500 pieces or something like that and Henry has got this puzzle laid out on the table and he finally gets mad and he just stands up throws up his hands in the next picture Henry's got a pair of scissors he's cutting the pieces to fit the way he wants them that's what we try to do with scripture from time to time is cut the pieces to fit where we want them to fit there's a difference between faith and works been long debated by uh, theologians for centuries. Some argue from James, some argue from other passages. That's a rabbit trail I'm trying to avoid right now. But there is a difference between faith and works. Faith says I trust the object. Okay? I uh, frequently use the illustration of I were on the top of this building and I believed with all of my heart that I could fly. I could start flapping my arms like a bird. I can, and I can maybe get enough drugs inside of me to really believe that if I jump off of this building, I can fly. My faith is strong. I can fly. Why can't I fly? Because the object of the faith is not designed to fly. So that faith is what Paul says is worthless. If the resurrection is not real, then your faith is worthless. Okay? It is what you believe in or who you believe in that is where the power is. It is not the fact that I have faith. It is the place that I put the faith. Now, faith first works. I can trust God. And I can trust Him to lead me in the right works. And sometimes people say that, that if you have faith, you will produce certain works. 
maybe or maybe not. I do know that we have a lot of fruit inspectors. Goes with the gift of judging or criticism, another another term for that. That if we do not see certain fruit, we get uh, really judgmental. All I have to do when I get that way, because I do from time to time, is read Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe dill and mint and cumin and neglect the way your provisions of the law, justice and mercy. You travel about on land and sea to make someone twice as much a disciple of hell as yourself. You have your faith in the wrong object. You are doing your works, but you are doing them for self-glory and vain glory. You're like whitewashed tombs that's on the inside is dead men's bones. They were looking at the works Jesus did and amazingly rejecting them. If ever there was fruit, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he gave sight to the blind. If ever there was fruit, he had the fruit, and they rejected the fruit. The difference is between faith and works. You have the trust, hopefully, to do the work. But some people do the work without having the trust. Some people do the right thing for the wrong reason. Works are supposed to come from faith, but there is a difference between faith and works. We must be careful to look for the uh, differences. Another uh, issue is the uh, uh, reality, is the security of a believer's salvation and the reality of sin in his life. Um, sometimes people think a believer can't sin. I've read 1 John 3. No one is born of God <laughs> sins. But I read 1 John 1 before I got there. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar. Who's the we? Believers. John's a believer. If we if we believers say we have no sin, we are a liar. And the truth is not in us. He wrote that to combat a rising heresy called Gnosticism. That basically said, since Christ took away sins, there is no such thing as sin anymore. So anything that you did, immoral, <laughs> untruthful, it's not sin. Jesus took them away. John said, wrong. <laughs> if we confess, we believe our sins. He, God, is faithful. He does it every time to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that sinful decision may have consequences that we may get to write out. My little child, my little children, both of them did this. They would do something wrong. Well, they had to face the discipline. And they said, but dad, I confessed it. It became a license to sin. Okay? God does not give us licenses to sin. Shall we sin so grace shall abound? May it never be. <laughs> he said, I want fellowship with you. Sin gets in the way of this fellowship. And there's got to be a way for a Christian to restore this fellowship. What do we do? Daddy, I said, I made a mistake. I judged, I lied, I fill in the blank. 
And he says, okay, pay for it. You realize the problem. Okay? There might be consequences mm-hmm. to it, but I'm with you through the consequences. I'm with you through the discipline. But you need to undergo the discipline so you can learn how to grow up. So, you don't use confession of sin thinking that it's a license to sin. That's a mistake. Now, principle 10 is consider the context. This is near and dear to me. Near and dear. How many people know someone who has taken a verse out of context? Okay. Huh? Judas went and himself. And you want to do like what? <laughs> we all know people who have taken verses out of context. Whether you held your hand up or not, I know you do. Okay? Now, how many of us have taken a verse out of context? Your head is. The glare. I love that. (laughs) We, we, as pastors and teachers, we're going to try and teach our flock how to feed themselves. I'm, I'm here, hopefully, to help you learn how to fish better. You, you, you men are already students of the Word of God. You use everything you can get your hands on to study it, and I'm all struck by that. And I truly mean, when I say it, I'm humbled to be in your presence. Because you do, indeed, want to know and you seek God's will. And that is such an amazing, amazing blessing. And to do that, we have to approach Scripture to to make disciples. You have to learn it so you can grow. But you have another step. You have to learn it to teach it. And you want to teach your people how to study the word for themselves. You want to teach them how to fish. You want to teach them how to read the Bible. Does that sound scary? Are they going are they going to come up with wrong conclusions from time to time? It's an opportunity to shepherd. It's an opportunity to guide. The Reformation began when, whenever the printing press was invented and they began to get the Bible into the hands of people and they made mistakes, yes but they got the Bible in the hands of the people with sola scriptura the Latin sufficiency of scripture they taught sola Christos the sufficiency of Christ they taught sola fide, the sufficiency of faith. Sola gratia, the sufficiency of grace. The whole Reformation was built on like five points of doctrine. And they got the Bible into the hands of the people in their own language. Now, hopefully your people can, can read. If they can't, a ministry would be to teach them how to read. In the United States, in the early 1800s, when they established schools, this was their reading text. They taught them how to read by reading the Bible. What an outreach. Teach somebody how to read by reading the Scriptures. They're going to learn about a lot of people and things. And they're going to get to learn it for themselves. And they're going to own it. (coughs) <coughs> and you can teach them. You may have another great evangelist come out of your church. Um, Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, 
Have any of you heard of him? No. He was, uh, he went to church one Sunday morning through about two feet of snow. Only 12 people showed up. Pastor couldn't get there. One of the deacons was tapped to fill in. Now, would that scare your deacons to death? This deacon didn't know what to say. He spoke for about 15 or 20 minutes. And about all he could say is, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And if you will study his word and seek his will, he'll show you what it is. A 12-year-old boy was changed. In the middle of a snowstorm, nobody showed up to church, not even the pastor. And the message preached. You may have another evangelist that comes out of your church. What a blessing that would be. Give them the opportunity is what we do. The near context, except for the first and last verse of the Bible, every other verse has something in front of it and something behind it. It's either another book, it's another verse, something fits. It's called context. And even as we saw, the first verse has another verse that is before that, John 1.1. So, there is a contextual flow of the Scripture as you're reading through the Scripture and you're giving a title to the paragraph. What you're do is doing <coughs> is watching the pattern flow through that book that the divine author is weaving. And you're seeing his pattern develop as you go through the book. So, you're paying attention to the context. Immediate context example, John 5 1. We've already, excuse me, Galatians 5 1. We've already talked about it. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Keep standing firm. Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Does that freedom give us a license to sin? 5 13 says no. If we take 5 1 and preach it, <laughs> Without the qualifier of 5.13, it says, do not use your freedom for an opportunity for the flesh. How free has Christ <coughs> set us? We even have an opportunity for the flesh. That's free. It's also accountable. Through love, serve one another. That's the choice. The choice. Immediate context established, or the near context. The intermediate context is the next one. I'm sure you've read this passage in Matthew 24. Two will be standing in the field, one will be taken, the other shall be left. Okay, who's taken? Is it the righteous taken out from the wicked? Or is it the wicked taken out from the righteous? The rapture is the righteous taken out and the wicked left. And the second advent is the wicked taken out and the righteous left. That's a big deal. It really is. It's a big deal. I know it's a big deal. 1985, when I was first teaching that part of the gospel, I got it wrong. That's why it's in this book. God said, I'll, I'll show you so you can show others. Matthew 13, 49 is an intermediate context. And it is in the same book. That's what is meant by intermediate here. It's not in the immediate paragraph. That's near context. But it's in the same book. And the thing about it is it is before... Matthew 24. It's Matthew 13. I bring that up because I was studying Mark verse by verse. 
And I got to Mark 13. You know the Olivet Discourse. And its parallel passage is Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So I was studying Mark 13 and decided I would bring in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 into the study of the Olivet Discourse. So, going this way through Mark, this way into Matthew and Luke. I did not have the complete context of Matthew when I did it. And that is not mentioned in Mark or Luke. So, out there by itself, two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. I did word studies, Epi Lombano, I looked and looked and looked, and still got it wrong. Because I read on ahead. <laughs> which sent me back to Matthew 13, 49, which says in the passage that also speaks of the last days where Jesus is talking. It says that the wicked will be taken out from among the righteous. So in that book, that's what Jesus was talking about. The wicked taken out from among the righteous. <coughs> that is second advent. Second advent. So if I read there and see the second advent, that helps with my context for the rest of that prophetic discourse. It establishes it. Why is that important? Parable of the talents. Parable of the wise virgins. Separation of the sheep and the goats makes a big difference on the interpretation and application of the next chapter even. That's why it's so important to go through, I believe, a verse at a time. <coughs> Topical studies are one thing. But when you go to a verse <coughs> in a book and put it into the topical study, Please just stop long enough to think where does this fit? Am I taking it? Put it in the context of that book. That's what I'm saying. Put it in the context of the book of Matthew before I bring it into a study on Mark on last day. Okay? And then the remote context. This is when a similar topic is referred to in another book of the Bible because it's still context. It is the completed, inspired Word of God. So it is all accurate. And it's up to me to find out how the puzzle pieces fit. The veil of the tabernacle is one of the examples that is used here. We are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 the veil is a picture of Jesus Christ through the veil which is his flesh he is saying that there is going to be an entry from the holy place into the holy of holies the entry will be accomplished by Jesus Christ the veil that is his flesh the entryway is a door. <laughs> I am the door into the sheepfold. <laughs> Look at all the connections that are made out of, out of those passages by looking at remote context. I am convinced that the book of Revelation is a summary of unfulfilled prophecies. And I may have mentioned that already. There are prophecies in the Old Testament not yet fulfilled that God will fulfill. One example. Revelation 18. The destruction of economic Babylon. There are three complete chapters devoted 
in the Old Testament to the destruction of economic Babylon. And if you want the complete picture of its destruction, you'll go to the 47th chapter of Isaiah that also speaks of the fall of Babylon. You will go to chapter 50 and 51 of Jeremiah. And you will find you will find out a very complete description of this entity called economic Babylon. Now, if I am going to study Revelation 18, I need if I'm studying Revelation, I need to know the other 65 books before it. See, let's take some principles. Progressive Revelation. Babylon was introduced in Genesis 11. It's a worldly mindset that leaves God out of it. Babylon became a nation. We know that. Defeated the, the Jews, 586. We see Babylon moving through history. But there are prophecies about Babylon that are not fulfilled. And Revelation 18 picks it up. So we have more of the puzzle pieces in another part of the scripture, the remote context, to identify for us that chapter. Context, context, context. Extremely important. The eleventh principle is interpret comparatively. Sometimes we try to build a doctrine on one passage of Scripture. And that's dangerous. <coughs> because the real doctrines are dealt with in many places of Scripture. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every fact be confirmed. So the Lord has attested to various doctrines in different places. We are declared righteous, justified, because of faith in Jesus Christ. Correct? Justification by grace through faith. Where is it taught? Genesis 15, 6 is where it's taught. Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4 is where it's taught. Galatians mentions justification by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith in that not of yourselves. So you compare scripture with scripture and that's where you put together a theological picture of a given topic. Now chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 in this book that we'll get to tomorrow starts <coughs> to do just that. And that's what the attempt is to do. We are putting together a big puzzle and we are looking at individual pieces. What does reconciliation mean? We look at every verse that mentions reconciliation and we put together a picture of it. What does propitiation mean? Every verse, every verse that mentions it, we put it together and we get a picture. And Scripture will interpret Scripture. Comparison of Scripture will illumine Scripture. You'll get to see how this fits together and you will let not your own desires interpret it. You will let the divine author tell you what it means. <coughs> that's that's our desire. Interpret comparatively. Uh, Twelve is seek the harmony. And this principle recognizes the truthfulness and faithfulness of God. 
He's not the author of confusion. There are no contradictions, real contradictions, in the Bible. It is unified, framed, inspired by the living God. Thus, all of its components are consistent. Disagreements concerning, concerning interpretations are human, not divine. Okay? God gave us this book to figure out how it fits together. Oftentimes, in the sand, people base their emotional security on their understanding of some scripture, their personal understanding of it. Scripture warns us against doing <coughs> such things. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge <coughs> him. He will make straight your paths. We study to show ourselves approved unto God, but we don't have faith in our own knowledge to the exclusion of the one who gives it. We look to him. Now, we get to learn more about him. We get to appreciate him more through the more we through the more we study. Uh, <clears throat> some things in the Bible we'll never understand clearly until we meet the Lord face to face. Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now we know in part, then we'll know in full as we have been fully known. The um, Harmony Scripture, uh, what we're going to find is that God just smooths the path out in front of us. He lets us see how things fit together. Now, Principle 13, we don't have enough time to get into. I was trying to finish this, but I don't want to run through dispensations and, and not get it. It's exceedingly important. Uh, a dispensation, I'll let you ponder Hebrews seven twelve, which says, where there is a change of priesthood, of necessity there takes place a change of law. <clears throat> Dispensations began to be more clearly recognized in the late 1800s. It okay? does not mean it's a new doctrine. Paul recognized dispensations. Peter recognized dispensations. Sometimes the term has been misused, and sometimes liberties have been taken with it that should really not be there. I heard some people say that the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus delivered, blessed are the poor in spirit was only applicable to the Jews in the Millennial Kingdom because he gave it in the age of Israel. I don't think so. <laughs> he was giving universal principles that blessed are the poor in spirit. Plus, I hit the passage where he said, Blessed are you when men persecute you for my name's sake. And I thought, how does that fit the millennium? There is no persecution in the millennium by definition. This is a passage that is applicable to us. It, is, it relates to us. So while dispensations have been misused... <coughs> it does not mean that you throw out the whole concept of dispensations. Because where there is a change of priesthood, of necessity, there's a change of law. Some people say the dispensations had a long transition period from the age of the Gentiles to the age of Israel to the age of the church. And yet, if that verse is your control verse, your marker verse, it says, I'm going to look for a change of priesthood because God's going to change the law when he changes the priesthood. Then that gives me a change of dispensation 
within a 24 hour time frame. God changed the priesthood on one day. Every time he changed it. Now, that lets us see a divine flow of history. And it lets us see that certain things were applicable to certain dispensations and not to other dispensations. Like, Abraham married his half-sister, Sarah. But that was in the age of the Gentiles before there was a Levitical priesthood which brought about a whole different set of laws which made that off limits. In fact, it could even be punishable by death. But Romans 4.15 tells us where there is no law, sin is not imputed. If God did not set it off limits, then it's not imputed. <clears throat> Romans 5.13 tells us the same thing in case we didn't read 4.15. <clears throat> okay? Twice he says it. So, tonight, you can think about where did the priesthood change? Where did the priesthood change? It's a very specific day that it changed every time it did. And every time that it will. So, I'd like you to work on that tonight and talk about that and discuss that because that's crucial to prophecy. It's crucial to the interpretation of prophecy as well. <clears throat> and nobody in here is interested in prophecy, I know, but if you are learning <coughs> about dispensations, it will be helpful. This morning we are going to start out in the Old Testament. So turn with me, if you will, to First uh, Kings. We're going to talk for a minute about Elijah. First Kings chapter 19. Some of you will recognize this uh, passage, uh, this material just from the reference. In, in this passage, Elijah has just had a great victory. He called down fire from heaven. God burned the offering that he offered to God. The, off, the offering that the priest of Baal offered was not judged. Uh, he killed all the prophets. Uh, it was a tremendous victory, and then he prayed for rain. Uh, and after a long drought, the nation finally receive his first reign. And so he had had a tremendous victory. He was, we might say in the U.S., on a mountaintop. He was, he was feeling very, uh, very accomplished, very, uh, uh, maybe even proud of what he had done. But right after that, immediately after that, Jezebel came into the picture. Now, if someone was going to do something, it should not have been Jezebel, it should have been Ahab, but he was not much of a man, not much of a leader, uh, certainly not a good husband, so he left it up to his wife. And Jezebel stepped in, and she decided that she needed to do something about Elijah. And so we would say, again in the U.S., she put out a contract on him. She wanted him killed. And immediately, instead of turning to the Lord, even though he had just had this great victory, he ran. He panicked. And some of you this week are going to learn things here. You're going to, to feel like this is a victory. You're going to be inspired. You're going to be charged up. And then you're going to go back home to problems. Now, it won't be someone maybe who wants to kill you, although some places in India that could happen. Some places in our own country, in the U.S. now that can happen. But you face problems that may be just a car is broken or the roof is blown off of your church. Uh, maybe a sick child. Maybe if you're a pastor, 
some of the deacons have uh, gotten together and resigned while you were out of town. Something happened. But you're going to face problems, whether it's the next week when you go back from here or sometime in the future. Now, after we have a victory, a great uh, a time of accomplishment, we are very susceptible to then the feelings of defeat, the feeling of discouragement. And that's what happened here to Elijah. He was riding high, we would say. He was feeling very good about what was done, what had been done, and suddenly he was crushed. But again, instead of turning to God, he ran. And uh, verse 3 of chapter 19 says, He was afraid, he arose and ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He went almost as far away as he could go in the nation to get away from uh, Jezebel. Now, he just faced 450 prophets. He had just faced the king. But now, one woman has chased him off and he runs to the hills to hide. Instead of turning to God, he ran. He faced a great period of discouragement and he felt sorry for himself. And if you go on down and read, he found the juniper tree and uh, in verse 4 and 5, he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life. I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under the juniper tree. He wanted to die. He said, God, I'm finished. This is over. Take me home. I'm done. He was feeling sorry for himself. He was alone and he was tired. So what happened? God sent an angel to him. And he told him to eat and rest eat and rest. And just because you face periods of discouragement or depression or whatever you want to call what Elijah was going through does not mean it's a sin. It's part of life. Everyone faces periods of being discouraged or being down from time to time. But how you respond can be. There's really two two applications to this passage and one is to the person who is experiencing those feelings and one is to his friends because we can see what God did to assist Elijah he talked to him and encouraged him he asked him some questions he didn't say you're stupid you have no reason to feel this way get up off your rear end and get going but instead he asked him some questions he encouraged him he told him to rest, get some sleep, take some nourishment. He didn't offer him answers, but he questioned him about why he was feeling this way. When you as a pastor have faced someone who is dealing with this, that is one way you can address it. Encourage them. Try to get them some assistance to, to have nourishment and get some rest. But you can't, you can't fix the problem. That's what's leading them to God. God provided food and he provided rest and then later he provided a friend Elijah went on and eventually then he met up with Elisha and the two of them could then minister together when you feel this way sometimes the best thing you can do is just rest Take some time away. There's nothing wrong with simply resting when you're when you're crushed, when you're down. It can happen to anyone, and if you look through Scripture, you're going to find examples of other people. Uh, King Saul felt so discouraged that he took his own life. Jonah was discouraged, although it was for the wrong reasons. But he was discouraged when when uh, Nineveh repented. There's a lot of examples. King David was discouraged. But the greatest theologian in the New in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, also felt that way. And in Second Corinthians, in the first chapter, if we can find it, Second Corinthians chapter one, verse eight and nine, he said, uh, 
We were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we did not trust in ourselves but in God. Paul was was very tired and he was down. He was discouraged because of what was going on with the Corinthians. And then we go over to chapter 4 and we see again where Paul describes the persecution that he had faced. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. And then now in verse 17 of chapter 4, he calls this momentary light affliction. He says, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but things which are not seen are eternal. Paul could look beyond what he was facing day to day. The, the persecution that his physical body received, the, physic, the spiritual and emotional persecution that he faced, even just dealing with the church of Corinth. And he called all of these things a uh, momentary light affliction. Now I'm sure that if you and I were facing what Paul faced, we wouldn't call it light affliction. When he was being beat, when he was lost at sea, when he was uh, unfairly uh, prosecuted, when he was unfairly imprisoned. And yet he called all of those things momentary light affliction. And he says he could do that because he kept his eyes on things that were, that were eternal, not on things that were temporal. The solution, when you are feeling crushed, when you're feeling overwhelmed, is get some rest, get some nourishment if that's what's needed. Look beyond the day-to-day things that are, are burdening you down, that are overwhelming you. Look to the things that are eternal. Look to God. He has a plan for you. You know the verses in Jeremiah where he wrote to the nation of Israel, and he says, I have a plan for you. That was written to, to the nation, not written to us as church age believers, and yet there's application. If he knew he had a plan for us, how much more does he have a plan for us who are adopted as his children? So sometimes we feel alone, forsaken, we feel down. Turn to him. Turn to him and wait for him to provide the solution. Don't look to do it yourself. Find a friend if you can, and a pastor to talk to. That's very important. Someone to share the burden with. Um, the Greek word, um, I have no Greek scholar, but I think it would be parakaleo, through. Call, call alongside. Someone to come alongside and share the burden. Uh, you need a friend to talk to. So don't don't think that you sin when things like this happen because it's going to happen. You're all going to face these times. Step back, get some rest, get some refreshment. Take it to the Lord. Look for His plan. Go to Him in prayer. Try to find a friend to share it with. Know that it's a short-term solution. That even if it lasts for what seems a long time in this age, in this body, it is, as Paul says, momentary life affliction. Look for the eternal. Don't look only at the day-to-day affliction that we face. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Has anyone in here ever felt alone? It goes with being a pastor that at times you're going to feel like there is no one else out there to go. But um, I, I, I think too that Charlie didn't quite get to was he told Elijah there's 6,000 more like you Remember? He was alone, he thought, but he wasn't. 
uh, this group of men right here hopefully it, it is becoming friends this week if you weren't already and I hope we uh, have some friendships that develop that uh, you feel like you can call someone talk to them uh, a real friend will uh, offer help without judgment unless you ask so uh, I I feel closer to all of you already and uh, you have just been listening to me and I haven't really had the time to listen to you and uh, I don't know that there's time while we're here one of these days though we're going to get to step as long as we want you will understand my English or whatever other language God chooses for us to speak and we will all be able to communicate uh, in a mighty way uh, we are at page 162 <coughs> studying the principles of interpretation and we have seen that we are to try to gather data from all over scripture about God about Jesus Christ and then we are to learn to compare scripture with scripture and seek to be wise in the comparison of that scripture with scripture one of the most uh, one extremely important thing is what is called dispensations now I uh, when I went to seminary I was taught a model of dispensations that had seven dispensations in it. I have since seen six dispensations eight dispensations and then I've actually seen people become hyper dispensationalists. Hyper dispensationalists mean that they find things they don't like in the New Testament and they make it a separate dispensation. I know one group or one individual that decided that only the writings of Paul were valid for the church. That doesn't make a lot of sense since John in Hebrews uh, and the uh, epistles of John were written after Paul died. If I was going to make a separate dispensation I think I would take the latest information to make that. Another man said Paul wrote 13 epistles. That's the number 7 and the number 6. The number 7 is the number of perfection. The number 6 is the number for man. Therefore, 7 of his epistles teach divine viewpoints and six of his epistles teach human viewpoint. Therefore, he only selected the seven that he thought by his own subjective evaluation was the five viewpoint. That is called hyper dispensationalism. When we compare scripture with scripture, the whole book is our uh, is our God. That means we have to consider all of the passages, but consider them for the time that they were written for. Now, many people began the age of Israel with the promise to Abraham. But that has some subjectiveness to it. I have told you I started my college studies in chemical engineering. I ended up with a degree in management and 
a minor in chemistry. So I like things to fit if they truly fit. I don't want to take a hammer and beat on them until they fit or scissors and cut them until they fit as well. But I, when I see something that God has established as a structure, I grab hold of that very fast. And Hebrews 7.12 to me is a structure that he has established for different ways that he deals with people in different times of history. That is what a dispensation is. God didn't change. He is unchangeable. The principles did not change. But the method of expression was changed by God. Okay. When I first heard the difference between that there was a difference between form and function, okay. functions are absolutes, forms are not. The function is what God calls us to do. The method of doing it, especially in the church, is often left to, as a function of our freedom to do so. We are told to offer praise and worship to God. Now, some people I notice raise their hands when they sing or when they pray, and other people don't raise their hands when they sing or when they pray. I was raised in a church that said if you don't raise your hands when you pray, you're not spiritual. <coughs> then I got enlightened and ended up in a church that said if you do raise your hands, you're not spiritual. <laughs> Churches have divided a group called the Dunkards in the 1800s they believed you baptized in the name of the Father in the name of the Son in the name of the Holy Spirit three times totally submerged underwater this way they had a split in the church because there was a group that believed you should be baptized forwards in the name of the Father in the name of the Son the principle is be baptized. Okay. Now, three times, in and out, or one time, in and out, or without causing any turmoil, sprinkling. It depends on the function you are trying to portray whether or not the way you do it is valid or not if you're sprinkling like the mercy seat is sprinkled as a picture of that that uh, sacrifice and that not everyone would partake what is your understanding of why you're doing the ritual? The Lord's table. Some people drink from one cup. Some people drink from one loaf of bread. Some people make people come to the front and protect. Others pass it out. Others it's administered by a pastor. Others it is passed around and everyone holds the bread and all eat together. Others it is passed around and when they receive it, they eat it. Which one is right? If your reasoning is correct, they all want it. See? It's the form. 
sadly, what we do as Christians is develop a form to carry out a function, like worship. Okay? If I am moved to raise my hands, I raise my hand. I don't raise my hands to try and get moved. Okay? That's me. Some might raise their hands to try and get the Spirit to move them. That's okay, too. It is the heart that God looks upon. Where is your heart? What is your motivation? It's not the sacrifices that the Lord wanted anyway, was it? It was the heart. That's what he's trying to tell us. Now, dispensations is a structure that God set up. And I asked you last night, when did the priesthood change? Because Hebrews 7, 12 says, where there is a change of priesthood of necessity, there is a change in law. So, what is the first priesthood called? Family priesthood. Okay? The patriarch of the family was the family priest. Job was the family priest. Abraham was the family priest. The oldest male member of the family was the family priest. He offered up the sacrificial animals. So we have Job and we have all of the book of Genesis. The patriarchs of Genesis were of the family priesthood. What was the law? There weren't a whole lot of laws, were there? If you kill your neighbor, Genesis 9, then you're to be killed. The law of capital punishment. There wasn't a whole lot of laws. There were some kind of laws about clean and unclean, but we're not told what they were. But when did the priesthood change? with the giving of the law of Moses. Okay. So I see the first dispensation called the age of the Gentiles from the fall of Adam until the giving of the Mosaic law. And that happened on a given day. Nothing arbitrary about it. Nothing subjective about it. God says it happened with the giving of the law. The priesthood became of the tribe of Levi. Okay? The Levitical priesthood under the line of Aaron, one of the Levitical priests, who would be the high priest. And the priesthood was specialized. And a whole series of laws were given. Over 600 laws were written down. So we have first dispensation, age of the Gentiles. Second dispensation, age of Israel. When did the priesthood change? Day of Pentecost. What happened? The church came into existence. The Levitical priesthood is no longer valid. Even though there were priests still functioning that way, they were functioning wrongly because the one sacrifice for sin for all time had come and made the sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, the... <coughs> priesthood then became universal. Even the ladies. Boy, that's different, isn't it? Before, it was always just the men. Now, there is neither Jew nor Greek. That means you did not have to be Jewish or the tribe of Levi. There is neither male nor female. You didn't have to be made. 
There is neither slave nor free. First Peter 2, verse 5 and verse 9. He has made us to be priests to God. Royal priests to God. We are related to the king in his family who is king of kings, lord of lords, and great high priest seated on heaven's throne. We are his bride. And we are priests to God. That means that we can come boldly into the throne of grace. We couldn't do that in the age of Israel because they were not permitted into the holy place unless they were a Levitical priest. So the Levitical priest carried in the message from the common people to present before God. Now we do it ourselves. Now we do not need an intermediary because the intermediary is Jesus Christ and he has already come. So you pray to the Father directly in the name of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the age of the church. That there is one. And, and when does that end? You know when it is. The rapture. Okay? The bride is snatched out of here. And then there's a seven year period known as the tribulation. Now, that seven year period is described in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Seventy weeks have been appointed for the nation Israel to do what? To seal up vision and prophet. To make an end to iniquity. Seventy weeks. Seven weeks, sixty-two weeks, and one week is what is described in that chapter. From the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. That's sixty-nine. Where's the seventy? The tribulation is the seventieth week of Daniel that has not yet been fulfilled. The age of Israel is being completed. Okay? That seven year time period ends with an event called the Second Advent. The rapture, we meet Jesus in the air. The Second Advent, he sets foot on the earth and we return with him. Two, two different events. When does the priesthood change again? Oh, that goes back to the Levitical priesthood. Even though it will be done wrongly again and for the wrong reasons and with the wrong motivation, it is still a Levitical priesthood. And interestingly enough, they will be offering animal sacrifices again because the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices in the middle of the week. Now, the Millennial Kingdom is the last dispensation and it is a different priesthood. From Ezekiel 40 through 48, it is the line of Zadok from the tribe of Levi. It will have a different perspective. For the age of Israel looked to the coming Messiah, okay, the millennial kingdom will look at the Messiah that has come. So those sacrifices are a reminder of what he did on the cross. 
so four dispensations that actually begin and end on a specific day and there's not a subjectivity to the selection of the dispensation. The priesthood has changed, the law has changed. Under the church, the universal royal priesthood, what is the law? Law of grace? Law of grace? Law of love? Law of love? That's it. To love your neighbor as yourself. To love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. So under the church, we do not offer up the sacrifices. Under the church, we don't celebrate the festivals the Jews did. Under the church, we don't have a hygiene code or a dietary code. We don't have those. Now, <clears throat> the millennial kingdom, the Lord seated on the throne, I think we'll get some new information then about clean, unclean, and what we what he expects of us and desire of Christ. That's a thousand year reign of Christ. Um, dispensations. Now <clears throat> interpret dispensationally means that if I am uh, reading in the book of Leviticus and it's a uh, cleansing of my house to get the leaven out for the feast of unleavened bread. It's the wrong dispensation. Okay? It might teach a principle to keep your house clean. And leaven is a picture of evil, so be sure the evil's out of your house. Okay? But it's not a law that's required to live by. The church age is known for the freedom that we have. Religion, when it evangelizes, has to impose a form. Okay? It's a form that says you have to do things this way. Okay? You have to do the Lord's table exactly this way. You have to worship exactly this way. Freedom that means we can go in titles of to my brother. And if it would cause my brother to stumble under the law of love, I would never eat meat again. See, that is freedom to do so. Not the, the law that is him to do other than the law of love. How do we love? Build up one another. Consider other people more important than ourselves. That's the church. Now I mentioned the tribulation, the rapture, the tribulation, second advent, millennium. That's all future. And that leads us to the 14th point. The first dispensation that they make is called the Age of Innocence, and it is Adam in the Garden before the Fall. And if you wanted to consider that a dispensation, that would be fine. The priesthood you can't identify because there is no sacrifices. The law you can't identify because it's don't eat from that tree. Okay? That could be a the first dispensation. Um, Schofield and others put um, the age of government from the fall to Abraham. Okay? And then from Abraham to uh, Pentecost, they had the age of Israel. So they inserted another time frame, uh, age of human government, 
to try and describe a long period of history. But there's no priesthood change that I can identify. Okay? And then some consider the eternal state another dispensation on the other hand. So it, it's not that there's anything evil or bad about what they did. I would not dare to presume that about about those gentlemen. But when I could when I was writing foundations and putting it together, we designed this for village pastors who only had a Bible. We were trying to give them basic theology. The dispensations is very important. So how do you teach dispensations to someone that has had no no theological training, no education. In Africa last year, we found pastors that did not know there was an Old Testament. Seriously. All they had ever had was a New Testament. And they were absolutely awestruck that there was another 39 books already written before they got to the New Testament. They didn't know about Israel and all of these things. Now, so the question is, how can we see dispensations clearly? Because I knew that people would ask questions like, where did you get that in this book? Where did you get that dispensation thing in this book? And I was praying about it in my office. And I said, Lord, this seems too arbitrary for me. I was picturing myself like we are here with a bunch of pastors that really didn't know anything. Not like you guys that know a lot, but that just didn't know anything about how will I answer that and stay in the Bible. And then Hebrews 7.12 just hit me like a brick. I have not found that passage, even in a commentary, this is where the dispensations break. But most commentaries are not dispensational. So that's part of it. But that verse just jumped out, and I thought, thanks, Lord, that's where it is. I can say Hebrews 7 12. Dispensationalism has been misused and misapplied. Okay? Granted. But that does not negate what it has tried to teach that there was different periods of time that God delineated himself. A different priesthood to me makes sense. Also, the, the function of the priesthood never changed. Their job was to offer sacrifice. Their job was to lead in praise. Their job was to teach. To study and teach. That's what priests did. It never, that function never changed. The mode of sacrifice did. <coughs> now we offer ourselves instead of an animal. Okay? The form changed. But the function never did. So, that, did that answer Daniel? I guess so. Uh, you're talking about the priest and uh, uh, about uh, what you call, you said there is no neither Jew nor great nor male or female. Uh, do you substantiate that uh, women can be ordained the priest? Well, that's a different topic. Um, when you said can they be no ordained pastors? Yeah. Can they be? I, I, Personally, do not think they should. Okay? That's my personal opinion. Because the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. Kind of tells me they should be a man, not a woman who marries another woman. But, uh, 
that's a violation of other scripture, comparing scripture and scripture. Now, to be a, uh, what you're asking about is the pastor or the overseer or the leader of the church. Maybe a pastor. Yes. But as far as being a priest and being able to pray and offer the sacrifice of praise women, that's their part, their part of the church, their priest. Okay? Uh, well, that's too distinctive that then. A uh, pastor is different from a priest. Yeah. Yes, there's a distinction right there. Well, yes. The, a pastor is a priest, but a priest may not be a pastor. But the pastor, I believe, is a spiritual gift. Okay? The priest is a spiritual gift, but of a different kind. Okay? If God gives you something, it's a spiritual gift. Charis means grace. It's a result of grace. A charisma gift is a gift given as a result of the grace of God. And that includes salvation. Romans 6.23 The free gift of God, the charisma gift of God is eternal life. Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that's a free gift. So, priesthood, free gift. Pastor, spiritual gift, free gift. That's what it is. Now, we started into prophecy, and I'm trying not to... Uh, I, I don't mind taking a few questions. I love interaction <laughs> like that. But we have to press on. Okay. Be careful with prophecy. And that's point 14. Be careful with prophecy. We have three points under this. And um, these are important points. But this is uh, obviously not an entire hermeneutical course on the interpretation of prophecy. There's a lot more that goes into it. But this is the summary point. Be careful with prophecy because people at times take prophecies that have been fulfilled and they read the newspaper and think they're being fulfilled again today. You have to determine if the prophet makes the interpretation. We know in the book of Daniel, Daniel is given instruction. He is given prophecies. He is, at times, given the interpretation of those prophecies for us. So, if the Bible makes the interpretation, that's the interpretation that you want to go with. That's the, the first thing. Is That's a comparison of Scripture with Scripture to see if the Bible makes the interpretation. Now, the next one is determine if the prophecy has been historically fulfilled. And <clears throat> that takes a lot of work to determine. Um, some of you have tools that will help uh, others uh, do not. And so that's why the point is be careful with prophecy. There are some things you can know have not been fulfilled, like the rapture of the church has not happened. The second advent of Jesus Christ has not happened. We know that those are future events, and we can teach and we can preach those with confidence and with accuracy. But when we start trying to analyze the European Union or start trying to figure out if Iran invades Iraq, if it's the fulfillment of this prophecy over here or that prophecy over there, we have to be very careful because many of those prophecies have already been when it is dealing with invading kings coming from other areas. Remember the Isaiah 
wrote primarily to the northern kingdom. And he told them about a scourge that is going to come on them if they did not repent. And the Assyrians fulfilled a lot of those prophecies. So if you're reading Isaiah, you have to keep in mind that this prophecy may have been fulfilled by an Assyrian king. There are some prophecies that we know are not fulfilled. And the scriptures even let us know they're not fulfilled. The passage about economic Babylon in Jeremiah 50 and 51. You know those prophecies have not been fulfilled because that is a prophecy of a total, complete annihilation of Babylon that destroys the land to the, to the point that no one will ever pass through it again. Now, when historical Babylon was destroyed, we know that that is not what happened. Because, do you remember the writing on the wall of the book of David with Belshazzar? Okay. That is the destruction of Babylon. Cyrus and his armies went in, dug in under the wall. And they came up inside the city and they destroyed the king and his family but most of the city did not know they had been captured for weeks. The entire city was not burned. It was not destroyed. And people have dwelt in it since. Now, either God made a mistake, which I don't believe, or he used very figurative language, which some people say that it's all just figurative language for the destruction, but there is no way you can read those passages and reconcile them with David. Then that prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. And you know that God, being God, who always speaks truth, is going to fulfill it sometime in the future. He is going to bring together a, se a sequence and chain of events that has never been brought together before in the history of the world. It will be geological upheaval. It will be astronomical uh, upheaval. The stars are going to be rolled up. They're going to fall to the earth. Meteors. You're going to have earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, everything imaginable in a seven year time span. And that may have happened locally at various points of the earth at different times in history. It's never happened all over the earth <laughs> on such a global scale. And then recognize the language of the prophecy. We have to consider figures of speech. We have already mentioned uh, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's a, a figure of speech. It's pretty easily understandable. The problem is when we begin making things figures of speech that the Bible did not intend to be figures of speech. That's called um, allegory. The uh, symbols such as the beast of the book of Revelation. Okay? They are pictures of literal things going on. A mountain is used in Revelation for a kingdom. There are many different symbols and figures of speech that you can identify scripturally. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist identify the Lamb of God as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That symbol is interpreted for us. That's what we want to look for in Scripture. So, recognize the language of 
prophecy. Okay, and we're going to uh, take a short break. I guess it's time for a short break. And then uh, Dr. Charlie's going to do the uh, fourth rule, seek to live the Christian life by properly applying God's Word. And uh, then we're going to start into chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. We're going to cover that for the next 38 minutes. No. <laughs> We're going to spend the rest of the time on them. And, uh, so anyway, let's take, take what, five, ten, something.